All right, it's review time. I need my sonic fuel. Let's do this. All right, let's get this going. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Seek and Destroy vlog, and today we are going to review Sonic the Hedgehog, the movie, uh, which just came out. It's directed by Jeff Fowler, written by Patrick Casey and Josh Miller. I'm not familiar with any of these guys' works before. I do follow Jeff uh, Fowler, though, on uh, on Twitter, um, and, and that was because, actually, what made me follow him is the thing that it's the elephant in the room, right? Everyone's like, all right, in your reviews, are you going to talk about it? And at first I wasn't, but let's talk about it a little bit before we get into the movie, which is obviously the redesign of the character. Uh, when this movie first was announced, I wasn't like jumping for joy. I'm not a huge Sonic fan. I played the first three when they first came out and then Sonic CD, which is my favorite Sonic game. And now I own them both, or I actually own Sonic 1 and Sonic CD on my phone uh, because you can download them for free and play them for free with ads or you can just pay $1.99 and get the whole game without ads. So I just paid the four bucks and I bought both those games and I've been playing them. So you might see some, you know, uh, footage of the video game from my mobile phone playing, you know, as, you know, this review goes on. So, uh, so yeah, a little plug for the video games there. If you want them, you can get them on your phone for two bucks, pretty good deal, or you can play them for free with ads. So, so I thought that was awesome. So I did that to get some footage for this review. Uh, but also, you know, the movie itself and the design. So like, you know, at first when they announced the movie, I was like, eh, whatever. I like Sonic. He's fine, but I'm not like a diehard fan. But uh, when they revealed the first trailer, I definitely had a reaction to the look of Sonic. I thought he looked like a, a weird stuffed animal come to life. And, I, and that kind of reminded me of that Christopher Robin movie. And I'm like, well, that makes sense if, if Sonic is an actual stuffed animal that comes to life in this movie. But it doesn't look like that. It didn't look like that in the trailer. It looked like he was like, you know, from another dimension or something. So I was kind of like, I don't know, is that going to fit? You know, is that going to fit the tone of this movie? And it turns out it must not have. And I don't think it did now that I've seen the final product. But uh, fans really backlashed on it. And it, in the first time, in any time I can remember, the studio and the director acknowledged. Because a lot of times people will say like, oh, you know, studios, you know, they shouldn't be influenced by fans or whatever. And I disagree. Uh, and I saw like an article on Hollywood Reporter go up about this. And I said, no, I disagree. Like, should fans affect movies? Absolutely. They affect every movie. You know why? Because there's always like, you know, screenings of movies and there's focus groups. So whether they're hardcore fans or they're like, you know, general audience moviegoers, um, they affect movies. Every movie in some way is affected by fans, has always been, because they always do these screenings and they always do these events. Trust me, I've been in numerous screenings out here in LA for movies and I've seen endings change. I've seen, you know, visual effects. Change. I've seen so much change. And so I, when I saw this article, I'm like, come on, Hollywood Reporter, you, the person who wrote that article, you have to know that people do affect movies. Uh, so this was just the studio's way of getting, a, a, you know, like a, a giant, you know, group feedback uh, from, you know, it was like a focus group from the internet. And uh, because it was unanimous, it was, you know, most people, like, you know, 80, 90% of people that were online that were talking about Sonic were complaining about how Sonic looked. And it was, it was great to see that we were being listened to, you know, like I wasn't jumping. I'm not going to lump myself in. I shouldn't say we, but, but I did see fans. Like I, at first I was like, yeah, I don't like it, but you know, whatever, you know, I'm, I may not go see the movie cause it looks weird. When I saw Jeff Fowler come out and say, you know what, we heard your criticisms and we are going to go back to the drawing board and rework this. And I heard the studio that developed it, uh, they actually said, yeah, we're going to use an earlier version. So I guess some executive or someone came up with the idea to do this version. And I'm sure most people fought against it. I'm sure a lot of the animators are like, are you sure this is the version you want to do? It, it looks weird. And, and some probably some suit or someone was like, yeah, this is the version. We're going to do that. And I'm glad that person got outvoted by fans. So uh, yeah, do I think fans should affect stuff? Absolutely, especially in cases like this. And I'm glad to see it pay off. I mean, you normally when fans complain about stuff and they and things, if something changes, they don't show up to support it. And this movie is not having that effect. Uh, this is, is kind of unprecedented. And I think that's why I wanted to do this review and talk about this movie. And we're going to get to the movie here in a second. But I just really want to shout out to the fans, to Jeff Fowler, to the studio, to everyone who brought change to something. Like no one was 
too egotistical or pig headed to stick to their guns and say no you, you know like because normally you hear a studio go you got to see it in motion you got to see how it works you got to see this you know they come up with all these excuses because they just don't want to work harder to fix you know anything or they don't want to admit they made a mistake and it was great to see that there was there was people who admitted to mistakes and that blew me away so congrats to the fans for getting what you wanted and because this movie in the studio changed the look of sonic and did a much better job with this cartoony design um because and i think it's because i grew up with movies like uh, you know who framed roger rabbit and space jam and stuff i don't mind when a, a human is next to a cartoon character that doesn't bother me as long as the story is interesting or fun and it pulls you in and it's a movie directed towards you know aimed towards kids which this was uh so that really you know it made me want to go see it. I was like, wow, I don't, I rarely ever see studios listen like this and admit that they made a mistake and then, and then do this and go above and beyond and then do a couple reshoots and pump up the good feedback they did hear from like uh, focus groups and early screenings, which was Jim Carrey was awesome. So it looked like they went back and added some more stuff with him. I don't know if hundred percent if that's true or not. I just heard some of that rumblings, but either way he stole the show. So yeah, um, that was the road leading up to here and I, I love it. And I, and of course the Rotten Tomato score is low, but I don't care about critics. Like I feel like critics don't know what they're doing anymore. Like most professional critics, they they don't know how to decipher styles of movies. They, they have this blanket of like, this is the frame of how all movies should be. And then they go in and they rate kids movies and horror movies and, you know, action movies, and they rate them all on the same grading scale. And it's like, you have to adapt and change and know what you're seeing. I saw Dr. Doolittle. I haven't seen the movie, but I saw the reviews on it where tr they, they trashed the movie. And I'm like, it's a kid's movie. You're being a little too hard on this, I think. And so Sonic, I, same thing. I'm like, it's a kid's movie. Why are you holding it to a certain standard? It's silly. It's a kid's movie. You know, <laughs> like, so critics, yeah, I don't know. They're they're detached and I don't really listen to critics anymore. I look for that audience score and, uh, and I like that I saw this one was at 95% and I agree. This movie was a lot of fun. Is it a perfect movie? No, of course not. Do I have nitpicks of it and critiques? Absolutely. But I'm holding it in a kid's movie standard. So it's not like I'm, you know, it's not like I want Shawshank Redemption out of my Sonic movie. Um, I wanted just a fun kids movie and it was it was cool and I actually got my um, roommate to come with me and he really enjoyed it too it was really fun you know we we're just like sitting in there that we went and saw it on Friday morning uh, at like an early screening at uh, Universal City Walk and uh, and he was you know like it wasn't full we didn't have a packed theater so I was a little worried I was like oh man it's you know but I'm like oh yeah kids aren't out of school yet but there were a couple kids in the theater and they were eating it up and I was like see this is what I'm talking about this is who the movie's for and uh, there was like a little girl over here with her dad and then there was like a you know a mom and dad with their son over here and you could just hear them through the whole movie just having a riot and just laughing and, and having a good time and it was like that's worth it like that's that's it man that's your target audience and you're bringing in new sonic fans because some of these kids probably even haven't even played sonic uh so it's great so their parents are like yeah the sonic was a game i played you know talking to his daughter and then they're seeing the movie and now she's a sonic fan so yeah this movie it delivers on that front you know like i said jeff fowler i'm not familiar with his work i think this is his first major movie so kudos to you sir i think you're about to make the highest grossing opening weekend you know video game movie of all time because right now this is tracking to make like you know 55 65 million dollars opening weekend which is definitely overperforming its original uh projection and i couldn't be happier and that shows that the fans complained the studio changed it and then the fans are now supporting that change that is an ideal scenario for something like this whenever something goes wrong like this this is the ideal scenario. And that's why it's unprecedented. And that's why I think just on that alone, if you're a moviegoer, you should go see this movie just to support that. I mean, that's that never happens, you know? So, so yeah, so I love this. And now, so Patrick Casey, Josh Miller, they wrote a pretty good script. I liked a lot of the characters in it. Um, Ben Schwartz, who plays the voice of Sonic, he's very funny in it. I actually found him very charming as far as like, you know, just playing a voice, uh, but he's a kid. Like he's a, he plays like this, you know, Sonic is a young kid and they kind of have this Bambi like style opening, which I wasn't expecting. So if, if, before we get into it, I want to say there's definitely going to be spoilers here. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, please go see it and then come back here and watch this afterwards if you're still interested in hearing my thoughts. Um, but yeah, so it kind of starts off like a Bambi, you know, type story where, where Sonic lives in this other world and he's running on rings and they, they show like him run across this one platform and the platform crumbles. And I was like, that's amazing. Cause that's totally something in the game where, you know, he runs across like a bridge or something and the bridge collapses. Um, and he's talking about how uh, in his world, he has to still kind of lay low because uh, he's, he doesn't have any parents, but this owl, it's like this giant owl, like long claw or something like that. She watches over him. She's kind of his guardian. But uh, but unfortunately, you know, she's like, you got to hide. You can't just be running around out there. And he's like, don't worry. Nobody saw me. Unfortunately, 
someone did see him. It was like this group called the In Incidas or something like that. And I think they're connected to Knuckles. I think that was a reference to Knuckles. Because again, I'm not a, like a, a purist on Sonic, but I think I remember something like that in some of the Sonic lore. I did read some of the comics that um, IDW, I think, put out when they did the Mega Man and Sonic comics. I was reading both of them side by side because they did crossovers a lot. And I was really liking that. So I, th I think I remember that from the comic books. Um, but uh, but yeah, so this like tribe shows up and he led them right to his house and they end up, uh, you know, killing essentially, or we we think may, may have killed uh, Longclaw. And but before she, you know, she gets stabbed with one of the spears by this tribe that are like, you know, these these uh, creatures that kind of, I don't know if they look like Knuckles too much, but uh, but I think there's from his same like t type of, uh, you know, whatever breed he is of, uh, of, of character or creature on this world. So, uh, so yeah, they hit her with a spear and I was like, oh, holy crap. Like I wasn't expecting this. And so definitely the kids weren't expecting it because I saw their their reactions were like oh no you know like and i'm like holy cow like they really they really went for that and so when that happened i was like wow it locked me into the movie because i was like okay i didn't expect this level uh to it like i was still going in thinking of a kid's movie but i didn't think it was going to have kind of that old school disney kind of vibe too that kind of pulls you in like i said like a bambi or something or like a, a a dumbo or something so i was like wow okay i'm hooked i'm, I'm curious to see where they go from here so uh, but before she you know dies i guess we don't know if she really does they don't show it uh because i guess that you know it is a kid's movie so they wanted to refrain from that but she has these rings so they bring in the rings from the video game that you know sonic's always collecting and the rings if you wish you know if you think of a place to go and you throw the ring out it'll grow and it'll become a portal like a one-way trip to that dimension i mean it is two-way but you only have a certain amount of time to run back through so uh so they kind of set that up in the beginning which is good so sonic is told to go into our realm and she said if anyone you know finds out about your power they're gonna try to steal it so you know do me a favor when you go to this world lay low just make that promise and he's like you know i, I don't want to leave you and then of course the thing you know closes and the, the you know the tribe descends on her with spears so you assume she's taken out um so it's pretty heartbreaking so now he's orphaned and he's on earth and they go through his life on earth and they show that he's you know, grew up in this place called uh, Green Hill, which is awesome because that's from the video game. Uh, Green Hill Zone, I think, was like the first level of the video game. So I was like, that's cool that they you know put that reference in there. And so Green Hill, Montana is like where the story is set. And I love it. As someone from small towns and grew up in small towns, I really like this. And it's a, it's about a journey of a guy named Tom Wachowski, uh, also known as Donut Lord. If you've seen the movie, you know why. Uh, but uh, Donut Lord is, uh, you know, is played by um, James Marsden, who plays Cyclops in X-Men. And he's really good. I actually really like him as an actor. And he's likable. That's the thing. Is he's a really likable guy. So he, and that was the thing. Tom has to be like this everyman likable dude right off the bat. And, and James does a good job at that. So he's, you know, kind of this, you know, the sheriff of this small town. And he feels like everybody there is kind of inept a little bit and they can't really take care of themselves. And he comes from a lineage of, of sheriffs, like, you know, his dad and his grandpa. And, you know, it, they've been watching over this town for like the past 50 or 60 years. And he wants to get out. He wants to go and actually be in his words a real cop he wants to go help someone in a life or death situation because around you know his town it's just like oh well, you know some raccoons got into the trash can and then it's like oh you know someone's the uh, duck stole a bagel so we got to go get that bagel back so it's like all things like that and it's like a very quaint you know kind of look at a small town and stuff obviously there's more to small towns than that but it's a movie so it's just kind of just showing the simple life and i liked it i was like wow that's pretty cool and then but he wants to leave and uh, and that's kind of causing a not a really a rift between him and his wife because she wants to her name's uh, tika sumter but she plays a pretzel lady aka uh, maddie wakowski and uh and so she says um you know like she's she gave up part of her life uh or he gave up part of his life to you know support her when she wanted to become a veterinarian and now he, you know, she has to give up part of her life so that he can move them to San Francisco and continue, you know, and try to be a cop there. So he got accepted and that's kind of his journey is he's going to San Francisco and that's where her sister lives who doesn't approve of their marriage for whatever reason. I don't know if they really established that, but uh, I, I'm guessing, I don't know, it doesn't, doesn't make sense to me because I was trying to look for a reason why the sister didn't like him and I couldn't find one. I was like, it, I, I don't know if there's a reason here that, you know, she doesn't like him uh, because it looks like they're moving to San Francisco where the sister lives. So now them being together is bringing the sisters closer together and you know so i, I don't know and then there's a niece character named jojo i think and she plays a a pretty cool role coming up later on in the movie uh but uh but yeah so the, but the movie starts off in like the third act and it shows you know uh dr robotnik chasing sonic through san francisco 
And he's like, all right, let's let's rewind. And they actually rewind the movie, which I thought was really cool that they did that. And they show Sonic uh, being lonely. And that was the heart of this movie was that Sonic feels alone. And he's in this small town that he loves tremendously. He loves everything about it. He's named everybody in town different things. Uh, you know, like he calls, uh, you know, Tom uh, Donut, Donut Lord. And he calls, uh, you know, his wife, he calls her Pretzel Lady. So it's, it's pretty fun. He gives everyone kind of nicknames and stuff. And uh, the, the rest of the town, really great characters in there. Adam Pally plays uh, Billy who's like the the side you know he's like the other cop and he's like the really inept cop he's like hey uh you know where are you and he's like he's like oh i'm in barbados he's like barbados how'd you get all the way to barbados he's like i'm not really in barbados billy and he's like uh, what do you want so i kind of like the the banter there and, and billy seemed like a really fun character uh but he kind of steps up at the end what i liked is that every little thing kind of pays off and i was like well that's good like it's, those are the things when you're you know trying to put a blanket on a movie of like, all right, the movie's got to do certain things. That's one of them. I feel like if you're going to set something off, try, try, you know, set it up, try to pay it off if you can. And this movie does that pretty good. Um, there's also a guy who's like, uh, he's called crazy Carl. And he's the one who has discovered Sonic is around, but nobody believes him. And he's been talking about Sonic for like 10 years and nobody's believed him or maybe not 10 years, but maybe a couple years. And, and no one's believed that, uh, you know, Sonic's a real thing until he shows up and he meets uh, Tom, you know, in his in his garage or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go beat for beat through this movie, but I did want to set that up and talk about how fun the small town felt. And I like the journey that, uh, you know, Tom himself was going on. That's a journey I've definitely been on where it's like, hey, I want to go to a big city. I want to move to L.A. I want to move to, you know, even from like Greenville, South Carolina, I want to move to Atlanta and then move to, you know, Florida, Orlando, Florida. And it's like, I've always been going to big cities, you know, for the past, like, you know, 15 years of my life, 20 years of my life. And I do, I miss that small townness. I really do. And, uh, and so watching this movie and seeing Tom go on that journey, it helped me connect with the character, actually. Like, I mean, I know I'm probably one in a million or so that might connect with that kind of story, but it did. I was like, wow, I, I'm, I'm liking the Tom character for this reason. I feel like I've been on this journey just like he has. And uh, now I'm about to move from L.A., you know, back to Orlando, at least. So it's still kind of a, a bigger city than where I'm from. But uh, but yeah, I feel like it's probably steps, you know, just steps to get me back uh, back home at some point. So um yeah, I mean, that's the, the monomyth journey, right? You, you go out into the world and then you come back and realize everything you wanted is, is right where you were to begin with. So I like that. I was like, that's pretty cool. And that's kind of the journey Tom goes through without, you know, spoiling every beat of it. Um, but I got to say, so we talked about Ben Schwartz. We talked about James Marsden, Tika Sumter, who I thought was really good in this. She had a sh very small part, um, but uh, but she had some moments. Like I love when she was like, I've been pretty understanding, right? I've been pretty cool during this. There's an alien in the other room. I'm, I'm doing, And he's like, yeah, you're doing great. And she goes, all right, cool. And they're like fist bump. She goes, all right, now that that's out of the way, what the F is going on? You know, <laughs> like that scene, I made me laugh a little bit. I was like, all right, cool. She addressed the, the ridiculousness of the situation, but then also, you know, had like a freak out moment too. So it was pretty fun. I like that balance there. Um, and then, like I said, the lady who played her sister, she was good for some comedy beats, but I really just didn't understand why she didn't like Tom. But her daughter, Jojo, the, the niece in the situation, she had a really great moment because Sonic, like I said, they really play up the uh, human, uh, humane angle with him. Like, a, you know, he's he's a living creature and uh, and Tom is, you know, kind of has to come around to him. Um, and he has on their journey on their road trip from Montana to San Francisco because Sonic loses his rings. They get teleported to San Francisco to a certain building. And Tom's like, yeah, I know that building. I'll take you there since you don't know the way. And I think also Sonic went with him because he was like, hey, I, I need a friend and I kind of want to make a friend. And so the movie kind of sets that up where, you know, Tom tells Sonic what a bucket list is. And Sonic puts down all these things he'd like to do before he leaves Earth. Because once now that Robotnik's after him and chasing him for his powers, he needs... You know, he needs to escape. And so he's like, yeah, I can't stay here anymore. I'm going to put you all in danger like I did Longclaw. Uh, I put her in danger. And he goes, and I don't want to lose anybody else. So, and he feels like he's friends with everyone in town, even though none of them know he exists. And I thought that was just really heartwarming, actually. I thought that was the heart of the movie right there. And so when he creates his bucket list, the one thing, they have a night out together and they they go to like a bar and they, they get in a bar fight and everything. And it's a, it's a lot of fun. The one thing Sonic was unable to cross off was he he put on there, I want to make a real friend. So when Tom sees that, I think it changes his perspective of Sonic. And so they be, start to become friends throughout the movie. And, and I really like that. I thought that was pretty cool. And so, uh, so Sonic, now that they've added this humanity to him and they showed he just wanted to be friends, he's, you know, he's this blue alien that's in a room at the sister's house in San Francisco. 
And the sister, she's like screaming, you know, like, oh, leave him, leave Tom. Like, he's bringing aliens around, like, you know, whatever, whatever. And she, you know, she's just going off and doing her thing. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, Tom and his wife are looking at this, you know, at Sonic, who's been knocked out at this point. He's, he's hurt. And she's, as a veterinarian, trying to, like, you know, help him the best she can. Uh, and uh, and then meanwhile, Jojo, the daughter uh, of, uh, you know, of, of Tom's wife's sister, their niece, she sees that Sonic has these old tennis shoes that have holes in them and uh, and she takes the shoes off because he's you know asleep and she takes the shoes off of him and she goes and gets a pair of her shoes which are the iconic Sonic red uh, you know with the white stripe shoes and she comes in and puts the shoes on his feet as a gift to him and he was he starts to tear up he's like no one's ever actually given me a gift before um, and that was awesome because I have actually I think I just saw recently on online where there was like a kid in a small town and he was poor and he used to get bullied at his old school. And then when they moved to a new town, um, the kids in class saw that he didn't have good clothes and didn't have good shoes. So they brought him shoes and clothes from their houses that were nicer uh, to make him feel like not so insecure about it. And uh, so I guess it was a combination of seeing that clip like a week ago and then seeing this movie. That's what made me think of when I saw her put the shoes on him. I was like, it made me think of that kid in that classroom who got all those gifts. And I was like, man, okay. I was like, yeah, talk about, you know, hit me right in the right in the emotions. Um, so yeah, this movie had some real emotions in it. I, I liked it. And and the the one thing we haven't talked about yet, the, the one thing I want to mention, I mean, we well, I'll, I'll get to the cameos first. Neil McDonough, uh, Michael uh, Hogan did some cameos. And then there's a cameo for a post-credit scene we'll talk about at the end because I'm going to spoil that, so we'll get there. Uh, but uh, it was cool seeing those two guys in here as quick, you know, like parts of the military and stuff. It was cool to see them in this movie because uh, I like their work and stuff, so it was, it was nice. Um, but uh, Jim Carrey, I mean, let's. this is what we've been building towards. Jim Carrey was freaking awesome in this movie. Uh, I loved, right before the movie came out, they put out this little special feature called Becoming Robotnik, and it was like a little interview thing with Jim Carrey and, and you know, and, and his kind of perspective of the role and what he liked about it and what he was able to bring to the role. And man, oh man, was it awesome. And it's so cool because Jim's had such a great career in movies. And I loved, I mean, I've loved him since In Living Color, you know, Fire Marshal Bill and stuff. Like, I've loved him since then. And uh, Venus de Milo. Hello, everybody. I'm Venus de Milo. <laughs> like, he's... He's so funny. I can't do the impression. He's so funny. And he was an idol of mine growing up. Like, you know, from The Mask, you know, I saw that movie like seven times in the theater when I was younger. Um, Ace Ventura, obviously. Um, I even liked uh, Cable Guy. As dark as it was, uh, I liked it. I thought it was awesome. Um, so he had a lot of his movies, and I think the number 23 or something, or one of, one of those, I think that was the name of the movie. But I've been following that guy's career, and I, I love him to death. And so to see him do this and come back because most people I'm telling you right now like most people would just be like I'll take it because it's a job because I kept thinking watching this movie who who else would they have probably approached to do Robotnik maybe like a Will Ferrell type or somebody like that and I was like would that would that have worked I like Will Ferrell he's funny but would that have worked and I kept thinking of these different you know maybe studio choices that they would have gone for but I'm so glad whoever made up the decision to do Jim Carrey was smart because I think beyond you know, the, the effects being, you know, redone and that drawing in, you know, audiences like me and the fans bringing them back. But I think Jim brings in a massive, you know, um, a mass audience. And Jim is, uh, you know, he's so funny, he's so talented. And to hear him in this interview say, oh, I'm very fortunate to get this role because um, I get to play a character that is nostalgic for a whole generation, but and also is now might one day be nostalgic for the current generation because a lot of kids are going to come see this movie and he goes and I'm very fortunate and I'm like to hear you know and I know you know sometimes actors speak for the camera and, and stuff like that but it's like I, I felt genuine there felt like a genuineness to that like he I think he really was like no I'm, I'm I'm grateful to have this role and who would say that like if you pull yourself back I know a lot of us you know a lot of you guys out there might be really hardcore Sonic fans but detach yourself from that imagine Sonic the Hedgehog is not your dream movie that you wanted made um, um just pull yourself back a minute and imagine an actor getting the role of Dr. Robotnik and truly feeling grateful to have that role and then delivering the level Jim Carrey delivered in this movie like man is that awesome like that that shows that one he's not above 
the job. He's not above the work. He's here to do a job, but he gave it his all. And man, oh man, is he just the best part of this movie, man. He is so awesome. He's so funny. The The banter between him and um, Lee, I, I, can't, I can't pronounce his last name, Majub, I think it's, I, and I hope I'm not butchering that because he was so great as Agent Stone. Uh, the banter between the two of them. I love the scene where he goes, where, uh, where uh, Robotnik turns to him and goes, push yourself up against the wall. And then, and then uh, Agent Stone just goes, like yeah he like pushes himself up like like robot and then robotnik gets in his face like so robotnik didn't want to make contact with him uh but he was like push yourself up against the wall and then he does it and i was like that that scene made me die laughing i was laughing so hard uh this movie and jim like jim really elevated the material to a whole new level and him as robotnik was a lot of fun he was cartoony in a way that you know the kids in the audience definitely responded to but i feel like us older you know members of the audience it brought us back to those Ace Ventura days and those mask days where he, you know, really was animated and he was almost like a character himself. And I think because of his performance like that, by making Sonic look not like a stuffed animal, but an actual animated character, that made it perfect. That was the perfect blend right there of human and cartoon character because Jim was acting like a cartoon. And I think that's what made that so perfect. And then why the movie has such a great balance to it. Like I said, is the movie perfect? No. Is there some nitpicks? Sure. They're not even worth mentioning here um, because I just had fun watching this. And after my surgery last week and uh, and then, you know, going back to work, I think I went back a little too soon. Uh, my immune system's definitely down. So, of course, I was at work for like two days this week. I got sick because everyone, a lot of people at my work were sick. And so were customers. So, of course, I got sick instantly. And I just had, I was having a rough week and I had a lot to do. And I'm moving coming up. You know, I got a lot to plan. I mean, I'm moving like six weeks after a surgery. It's like, it's a lot. My, my, my life is like, you know, at, at times feels like it's crushing down on me, but, uh, but so I really wanted an, an escape. And so yesterday, or, you know, when I went to see this movie on Friday, me and my roommate, I was like, please go see this movie with me. Um, I just want to laugh and, and have a good time and see like something fun and kind of remove me from, you know, the real world. And man did it. Movies are supposed to be escapism. And this movie helped me escape big time and I love the references they made to like the they were saying like oh I gotta move you know if, if it doesn't work out here on earth I'm gonna go to a mushroom kingdom and there was like all these puns where he's like well if you go there at least you won't be the only fun guy there and there's just like a bunch of dad jokes like sprinkled throughout and I was like yeah okay this is kind of cheesy but I, I liked it you know I'm, I'm all for that kind of humor so uh this was in my wheelhouse I thought it was funnier than I even originally thought it was going to be and I thought it was more heartwarming than I even originally gave it credit for. And for that, I got to give this movie an 8 out of 10. I actually enjoyed this movie. Like, I, I'm not kidding. Like, uh, you know, no hyperbole here. It's, you know, it's not perfect, but it is fun. It is, and sometimes we just need fun. Like, I, I know people hate hearing that word. They hate the, the idea of it sometimes. But, man, I'm telling you, if you just want to escape... If you just want to go see something that is, you know, you don't have to bring your brain to, you're just there to just kind of have fun and smile, do it. Go see Sonic the Hedgehog. Jim Carrey alone is worth the price of admission. But, uh, but you know, Sonic himself, Ben Schwartz, I thought did a good job. There's some heart to it. Um, and there's some great stuff. And there's definitely setups for sequels. So we'll talk about the spoiler real quick um, at the end of this movie. So again, if you don't want spoilers, you know, please go right now. Uh, but at the end of this movie, um, Colleen O'Shaughnessy, uh, Shaughnessy, O'Shaughnessy, Colleen O'Shaughnessy, she does the voice of Tails, and Tails does show up, he teleports into our world, uh, into, you know, into Forest Hill, uh, Montana, and he looks around, he says, all right, it says Sonic is here, so let's go, you know, let's go find Sonic, and then Tails uses his Tails, and blazes towards uh, town uh, and then meanwhile dr robotnik is got teleported and i love this because i was thinking about it the whole movie i'm like why don't when doc why don't you just teleport dr robotnik to the mushroom world because sonic definitely didn't want to go there he's like i don't want to go to the mushroom world he's like it's just it just smells like mushrooms and i hate mushrooms and i was like laughing at that i'm like is that like a reference to mario are there going to be pipes there or whatever it didn't look like there was anything like that because right? there's so there's no shared nintendo sega universe that's coming i don't think but there's most likely going to be a sequel especially if this movie actually does make 60 plus million opening weekend which i hope it does i mean this movie was just fun and if you haven't seen it yet please go see it like support this for a number of different reasons one it's a fun kids movie if you have kids you definitely got to go take them to see this um if you are you know if you appreciate the fact that a million a multi-billion dollar studio listen to fans online and redesign their character and then because of that fans are now supporting this movie in droves um yeah i think if you appreciate that synergy uh you know between studio and fan fandom 
um, I think that's worth supporting alone too. Uh, and then, like I said, Jim Carrey, like there's so many elements that should put you in the seat and watch this movie uh, at the theaters. So please go do it and, uh, and let me know what you think. If you've seen the movie, let me know your thoughts down below. And if you uh, haven't seen the movie, I don't know why you watched my whole review, but uh, I guess let me know your thoughts and let me know when you're going to go see the movie because it's really fun. And you know me, I don't review a ton of movies on here, uh, but I, you know, I had to make an exception this time because of the fact that, you know, they, they changed everything and, and it did. It, this, I think this could change relationships between fans and, and I don't want this to happen to every movie for sure. I mean, sometimes fans ask for stuff that is ridiculous, that you do not need at all. And sometimes, you know, the majority of fans will ask for that. And I'm like, no, 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 we don't need that. And yes, should we, should we not affect you know, a movie's vision, sure. The problem is I feel like a lot of times, and I talked about this with my roommate the other day, I think a lot of movies, that when they say vision, I don't think a lot of directors and, and people who make movies anymore really have visions. I think they just go through a checkbook of things that they need to put into the movie, and there's no real vision to it. This movie now feels like a more complete movie because of the redesign. Um, it feels like it's the movie it should have been to begin with, and uh, and that is, I think, something that could make both the studio and fans happy and so uh so i think it's a good blend of that and so yeah when i see people say should we interfere with uh you know movies visions i'm like you know george lucas and, and steven spielberg those guys were visionaries they had a vision of stuff back in the day i don't see a lot of that villa de, villa de Veneuve, or i'm sorry I'm, I'm i'm butchering his name the guy who's making dune coming up he seems like a guy who tries to have a vision when he makes movies um but i don't see that a ton from a ton of people um sometimes it's just hey we're making a movie and we're going to make it and it's going to be fun and it's you know but sometimes it does come across really corporate like a bunch of checklists this to me didn't this felt like after the redesign and stuff it was like no we want to connect with the fans and we want to give them something that they want and they'll be proud of as sonic fans and it looks like and to me that's what they delivered on and that's why i enjoyed this movie uh so if you agree let me know if you disagree let me know that too uh my rating is an 8 out of 10. If you've seen the movie, let me know your rating down in the comments below and we'll continue our conversation down there. But everyone who made this movie, Jeff Fowler, uh, Patrick Casey, Josh Miller, Paramount Studios, everyone who worked on this, even the studio that uh, did the visual effects of this movie who are no longer, I, I think the studio got shut down, I said earlier, maybe I mentioned that. Um, please, Jeff Fowler, Paramount, hire them back for the sequel. Find out who all those, you know, get all those names, get all the artists that worked on this movie. If they're out of a job, offer them a job say hey this movie was a big hit and that it's a big hit because of you and bring them back for the sequel please do that that'll be so awesome to know that these guys aren't out there struggling uh, i'm sure a lot of them did find other work and stuff but please extend that invitation say hey we made this because of you you took the time and the extra money to go the extra mile and make this design work and make it awesome and look at what the results were look at the audience you brought us um please say that to them offer them their jobs back, and get them started on Sonic 2 immediately. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.